today I want to tell you a little bit about how I became multilingual. And it's kind of a long story because I'm getting kind of old. But it started when I was, actually when I was a child, my family on my mother's side uh, spoke Ukrainian at home. And my mom grew up speaking English but uh, in a Ukrainian household in, in Canada. And I was always interested in languages and I think part of it was that my mom instilled in me a, a respect for other cultures and an interest for all the cool things that it would mean to be able to connect with other cultures. So somehow there was always a, an intrigue for me or, or an interest that uh, if, I, if I had other languages it would open new doors and open new worlds for me. So even when I was a little kid I learned my first few words of Ukrainian uh, so that I could talk with my uh, grandparents uh, I never really did learn much Ukrainian, but it was kind of cool being able to say hello and goodbye. And when I walked into my Baba's house, that's Grandma. When I walked into Baba's house, the first thing she said to me wasn't usually hello, but she would say, "Ty chochesh yiste? You want to eat?" So that was one of the first things I learned in Ukrainian. It was Baba's way of loving her family that she always made sure that everybody was well fed. But uh, this was probably the beginning of my interest in languages. When I was in junior high school uh, here in Western Canada, one of the uh, prerequisites for junior high school is, or for high school is that you had to take a second language and most people took French. Well, I wasn't very good at French and one of my teachers uh, felt that I needed to know that. In fact, she said that she couldn't really put me into the next grade because my French was so bad uh, that if I continued in French that I would be discovered as a, as a fraud. Uh, as a French student. So she said, look, I can put you into the next grade, but you really can't take French because it's just not your thing. And she, she said, you know, Keith, you've probably got some sort of uh, ability in music or, uh, you know, some other area, but language is just not your thing. And uh, so I took her word for that and I decided I wouldn't take a language in high school. But when I got into uh, high school, into the next grade, they changed the rules in the school that I was at and everybody had to take a second language. So I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I knew that I, I was terrible at French and I didn't really know anything about other languages except I think I had a friend who was going to do German. So I thought, oh, German's cool. I'll try German. I thought it'd be like really easy compared to French, uh, if you can imagine that, for an English speaker. But I really liked German. And I think the reason for it was that my German teacher uh, had had the language bug. He had discovered that languages opened doors for him. He spoke several languages. He was uh, Dutch, but he spoke German very well. Uh, the f the strange thing was that in high school, when I did I did uh, four years of German and I got very good marks, we never spoke German in all that time. I can't remember having a single conversation in the German language. I remember I worked my way through the red book in the first uh, two grades of German and then I had a purple book for the last two grades of German and I memorized 600 different uh, forms of irregular verbs in German and all of the irregular um, plurals for all of the nouns and I worked really hard at German. It, it's strange because I was I was young and maybe that's why so much of the German is still in my head, not especially functional but it's still there. I can remember words and I'm thinking, wow, that's a long time ago. And I've still got a lot of the German vocabulary there and the word order. I seem to get the word order right, which is quite different from English. Uh, but that was when I was a teenager, uh, my German experience. Uh, as I said, I got good marks, but I really didn't speak German at all in the years that I studied German, in the four years that I studied German. And when I got to grade 12, which is the last year of high school in Canada, um, I needed to fill up my schedule of, of classes and we were allowed to uh, select some elective classes, things that just interest, interested us. And I'd had a, a fairly good experience with German so I decided that to fill my schedule I would add in one semester of Russian and one semester of Spanish. Uh, but that year I got very sick and I spent most of the year in the hospital. So as it turned out, I did one semester of Russian in eight days. I had a book and I was supposed to get to a certain chapter and complete all the exercises and so on. And I did it in eight days. Uh, I did my Spanish a little, a little more slowly, but I had a really good Spanish teacher. And one of the things that he told me, he, he kind of reversed what happened to me when I was in junior high school. And he took me aside and he said, you know, Keith, 
you're really good at this Spanish. He says, you could actually learn how to speak this language. And uh, that was uh, like inner healing for me. That was amazing. So uh, uh, I did this one semester of Spanish, but it was kind of a, you know, a typical high school course. We learned to say very useful phrases like the cat is beside the chair. The pencil is red. Uh, didn't know how to do anything really practical or useful, but I certainly knew, you know, second conjugation, present indicative verb endings and that kind of thing. Um, but I really, I, I enjoyed Spanish and I was quite encouraged by my Spanish teacher when he said that he thought I was uh, actually capable of learning how to speak Spanish. Also, there was a cute girl in my class, uh, not in my Spanish class, but in, in the same grade, and she was from Argentina, I think. And that made Spanish more interesting to me. But when I finished high school, I moved away from Vancouver, the, the city where I was living at the time, and I moved into the interior. And within a year, I was married. And uh, my wife and I got involved with helping refugees who were coming to Canada and fleeing civil wars in Central America. And in those days, the Spanish-speaking people who were coming to Canada didn't speak English. So there I was with my one semester of Spanish, and I could communicate with people as long as they wanted to talk about the cat is beside the chair and the pencil is red. Um, you know, I could talk with people and I could say hello and goodbye, but I was forced to speak Spanish every single day. And I tried. I guess I was young and I was motivated and I was interested. And I discovered that I really liked the people. In fact, in, in those days, we were involved in helping refugees from uh, Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam and Ethiopia and Poland and uh, we just made a lot of international friends and I discovered that my world was so much bigger and my family was was greater my kids benefited from all this international contact um, so uh, this was this was really an eye-opener for me learning that what Spanish could mean to me I spoke Spanish all the time at first it was terrible Tarzan Spanish with no verb endings and not much grammar. I remember that for a long time I could only speak in the present tense. So I would say everything about the, that was happening in the present and then I'd throw in some expressions to indicate that I was talking about last year. You know, I said, I would say things like, uh, vivo en Vancouver el, el año pasado. I'm living in Vancouver last year because I didn't know how to use the past tense. But I would talk uh, badly in Spanish and now I tell my students you must speak bad Spanish or you'll never speak good Spanish and I really believe that you've got to you got to give it a try and start using your languages and then when you use them they will improve and your grammar will fix itself up as long as you're focused on using the language for real things and and using it with people language learning I believe strongly is a social experience and not an academic experience so it's the communication with real people that makes language learning possible and certainly that was uh, the case for me. Another language that I studied around this time was Esperanto, uh, the international language. This is an artificial language that has I think it's uh, 17 rules and no exceptions. Really interesting, like uh, I, I know that a lot of multilingual people uh, the differ in, in, in whether they value Esperanto or not. For me it was really quite useful. It allowed me to tackle the process of language learning and understanding language without having to deal with anything that was uh, breaking rules. Uh, so then when I tackled a language that was more complex and more difficult to to study and learn, uh, I understood things like well, like what's a direct object and what the present, past, and future tenses are, things like that. I had a good idea because I dealt with Esperanto. I also went to college and one of the electives that I took there was Latin and because of my Esperanto I could read Latin very quickly. It was uh, a lot of the vocabulary was easily recognizable either from my acquaintance with Spanish or my knowledge of Esperanto and uh, certainly understanding grammar from from German and from Esperanto helped me a great deal when I studied um, Latin and I also studied Koine Greek which is uh, uh, a, a form of classical Greek that was used in uh, the Bible. Um, after I learned Spanish, I was in a meeting one day with a group of people who were helping refugees, and and I noticed that two of the eight people spoke Spanish very strangely, but I could understand them, and, and I thought, where are these guys from? I can understand everybody else. At this point, my Spanish was getting uh, fairly comfortable, uh, but they were speaking Brazilian Portuguese. And I realized that with a little effort, 
I could learn Brazilian Portuguese because there was so much overlap in in uh, grammar and in vocabulary between uh, Spanish and uh, Brazilian Portuguese. So that was the next language that I tackled and thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, and I'm st I'm still working on all of these languages. I'm even working on my English. Let's be serious. We're never really finished learning a language. Uh, I went back to French after my terrible trauma uh, in high school with French. And after I tackled a few other languages, I I thought, okay, I could probably do this. I could probably make some progress in French. Uh, and it's always been slower for me to learn French than my other languages. Not because French is a, a bad language or more difficult or anything. It was because I was traumatized. It was because of my bad feelings around the, around the French language. And I really believe this is important. If you're going to learn another language, it really helps if you have good feelings about that language and about that culture. So all of my experience with Spanish was with wonderful people, great people, good food, you know, pupusas, you know, gallo pinto, and, and all of that stuff. Uh, the music, the, the culture, I traveled to Central America briefly. Um, it was all good feelings, and that helped me to learn the language, I'm sure of it. And making progress in French has always, I've had to work really hard at it, and I, I and now that I have uh, made considerable progress in French, I am aware that so much of it was a result of this uh, bad experience. This French teacher who told me that I was really no good at languages and made French gave me a bad feeling about French. That's really changed. I think one of the biggest changes was I I have a few few friends who are French speaking. I have one friend that I call my little sister, and uh, because I love her so much the language becomes accessible to me and and her husband now and uh, and other friends um, I needed to, I needed a personal connection I needed good feelings with French and able to in in order to make uh, progress in French um, I found Italian after Spanish and Portuguese and French Italian was pretty accessible to me but I learned it I learned to speak uh, in Italian very quickly and it also fell away quite quickly. I hired a young lady to work for me who, to teach Italian and within a few months I was talking with her in Italian. Uh, it's very similar grammatically to other languages that I've tackled and the pronunciation wasn't wasn't too difficult but it was very intense. I learned it really quickly and then I didn't use it at all afterwards. So it, it's slipped but it's kind of uh, in storage or it's dormant for me. And uh, those are the languages that I've uh, worked at most seriously but I dabble in everything. I try Polish with my neighbors. I try to speak Greek in the restaurant. I speak terrible little bits of Chinese, but I, little bits and pieces of everything. And uh, one of the things that I found is that the first language that I worked on took a very long time to learn. And the next one was a little better. And the next one after that was a little better. And I think that the longer we are learning languages, the faster it gets. We become much more efficient as language learners. So the next video I'd like to make, I'm going to talk about uh, how that has changed for me, why it was slower for me to learn my first uh, language, and it's so much quicker to learn another language now. At this point, I feel like I could learn just about any language I, I want, and it's just a matter of having enough time. Uh, I have to do other things in my life. I have to make a living. I've got, you know, a, a family and a wife, and uh, I'm running my own business, and I've got all sorts of things that that keep me occupied. And I think, wow, if if the days were 36 hours long, I could learn a whole bunch of languages. And the only thing preventing me from doing that is I really want to speak the half a dozen or so that I've worked on seriously. I want to speak them really well, uh, but I can't resist the temptation of dabbling in, in. Uh, Polish and Punjabi and Tagalog and uh, you know other things they do, and Afrikaans these all interest me so much and uh, it's really hard to exercise any kind of restraint or self-control uh, but that's my story that's how I got going on language learning and what I'll talk about in the next video is uh, what has changed for me uh, what kind of materials I use what sort of routines I follow uh, high-tech versus low-tech tools uh, that I use. I think I'm much, much more efficient at learning languages now than I was. And I like to think that uh, what I have learned I can pass on to you if you're, if you're learning new languages and it'll make the process faster for you. I'm absolutely certain that my students learn Spanish much faster than I did 
and it's because I did it first. Um, I, I understand why people want to be independent language learners, but I also know that my students benefit tremendously from the work that I've put in in learning how to explain the Spanish language to English-speaking people. Uh, I think it's much, much faster, and the efficiencies that I've developed, I can pass on to my students. They don't have to spend years figuring this sort of stuff out. So there's the beginning of my story, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I used to do and what I do now and what I'm working on, and I hope you find this uh, interesting. Talk to you again soon.